day of the Israeli attack on Iran and amidst heavy fire exchange, the Israeli Home Front Command confirmed Iran's first use of a new missile with a multiple warhead. According to a report from the Times of Israel, the missile's warhead opened at an altitude of approximately 7,000 meters, releasing about 20 submunitions or bomblets. Further information revealed that each of these bomblets contained at least 2.5 kilograms of explosives, which hit points in an area with an approximate diameter of 16 kilometers. Subsequently, the Israeli newspaper Jerusalem Post reported that Israeli army technicians were examining unexploded samples of these submunitions. The main goal of this investigation was to answer a key question. Was this weapon a conventional cluster bomb, or as Iranian officials had previously claimed, an advanced MIRV system with independently targetable sub-warheads? Despite the Israeli Air Force's claim of destroying more than a third of the long-range launchers and having air freedom in Iran's skies, the deployment of the new missile appears to have been a decisive variable in the final days of the war, to the extent that just two days later, Israel preferred a ceasefire. In fact, Iran's use of multiple warheads by targeting Israel's air defense capacity and not just its capability became one of the key factors in shaping the ceasefire conditions. The Wall Street Journal had warned that in a war of attrition, Israel's limited stockpiles of interceptors would be depleted faster than Iran's massive missile arsenal. In this video from the Top Strategist channel, we will examine the types of both these warheads, how Iran deployed them, and the problems Israeli air defense faced against them. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please subscribe to the Top Strategist channel and support us by liking and sharing this video. A cluster warhead is a dispenser or container that, after reaching a specific altitude over the target area, opens up and releases a large number of smaller submunitions. These bomblets are unguided and, after release, spread over a wide area based on gravity and ballistic laws. Unlike a conventional warhead designed for a concentrated and powerful explosion to destroy a fortified target, a cluster warhead is an area saturation weapon. This feature makes it an ideal tool for targeting soft and widespread targets such as air bases, aircraft hangars, runways, command centers, radar facilities, and logistics depots. Furthermore, this technology can turn a potential missile weakness, lower accuracy, into a strength. By using a cluster warhead, even if the missile does not hit the exact target point, the wide dispersion of bomblets ensures that significant damage is inflicted across the entire target area. Additionally, a portion of these submunitions is designed not to explode on impact, remaining in the area like landmines. This not only disrupts and endangers post-attack cleanup and rescue operations, but also turns the target area into a contaminated and unusable zone for a long time. On the other hand, the cluster warhead poses a unique challenge to the most advanced defense systems. An incoming ballistic missile, detected by radars in the upper layers of the atmosphere, suddenly turns into dozens of smaller targets in its terminal phase of flight. This situation changes the engagement equation from a one-on-one -on -one interception to a one-on-many. At this point, the defense system faces a difficult dilemma. Either allow these submunitions to pass through the defensive shield and accept the risk of widespread damage over a large area, or fire a very large number of expensive interceptors to counter them. This situation dramatically increases the consumption rate of defensive munitions and directly turns the war into a battle of attrition over resources and logistical capacity. In contrast to the cluster warhead is the MIRV technology, which stands for Multiple Independently Targetable Reentry Vehicle. This system represents a huge technological leap. In such a missile, after the main engine burnout, a special section called a bus, or post-boost vehicle, begins to maneuver in space, releasing the sub-warheads one by one. Each of these sub-warheads has an independent guidance system and can hit separate targets, perhaps hundreds of kilometers apart, with high precision. This technology, first operationalized in the 1970s by the United States on the Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missiles, revolutionized global defense and nuclear strategy. A MIRV-equipped missile forces the defender to fire multiple interceptors for each incoming warhead. This drastically shifts the balance in favor of the attacker and makes missile defense an extremely costly and technically almost impossible endeavor. Today, it is confirmed that only the world's top-tier powers, 
such as the United States, Russia, China, the United Kingdom, and France, utilize this system in their strategic arsenals. Iran's use of cluster warheads was not an isolated tactical action, but appeared to be part of a more complex strategy based on two principles, selecting appropriate platforms and combining threats to maximize pressure. Field evidence and analysis of missile debris found in Israel indicate that the Emed and Ghadr ballistic missiles were among the most likely carriers for these warheads. These two medium-range missiles, with a range of 1,700 to 2,000 kilometers, can reach any point in Israel, and their equipment with maneuverable warheads creates another challenge for defense systems. Alongside these two, analysts also point to the potential of the heavier Koramshar-4 missile. This missile, with the ability to carry the heaviest warhead in Iran's arsenal, about 1,500 kilograms, and a range of 2,000 kilometers, is an ideal platform for carrying heavy cluster warheads. In this regard, Iran's Ministry of Defense had previously announced the successful test of a 2,000-kilogram warhead with an advanced design, which, according to Iranian sources, can be installed on missiles like the Koramshar. This indicates Iran's focus on increasing the payload weight of its missiles to achieve higher destructive power or carry a larger number of submunitions. The Iranian armed forces use these warheads in combination with their other missiles to maximize the complexity of the battlefield for Israeli air defense. According to reports, alongside the missiles carrying cluster warheads, missiles with different capabilities were also fired. Solid fuel missiles like the Haj Qasim and Kaber Shaykhan, due to their very short preparation time, deny the enemy a chance to react, and the heavy Sejil missile possesses great destructive power due to its high warhead weight. But the most complex member of this formation was the FATA-1 missile. Fabian Hintz, an independent analyst and OSINT, open-source intelligence, expert in the field of missile and weapons proliferation in the Middle East and North Africa, believes that although FATA-1 is not a hypersonic glide vehicle, HGV, it is equipped with an advanced maneuverable re-entry vehicle, MARV. This warhead is equipped not only with aerodynamic controllers, but also with a small rocket motor with a movable nozzle, allowing it to perform complex maneuvers to evade interceptors, even outside the Earth's atmosphere. This combination of threats forces defense systems to simultaneously deal with speed, maneuverability, and area saturation, a scenario that pushes any defense system to its limits. For years, Israel's military superiority has been based on two main pillars a powerful air force for preemptive strikes, and a multi-layered, sophisticated missile defense system. Iron Dome for short-range rockets, David Sling for medium-range threats, and the Aero 2 and Aero 3 systems for countering ballistic missiles inside and outside the atmosphere. But the 12-day war between Israel and Iran revealed a truth to Israeli and American strategists. This defensive shield, no matter how advanced, does not have unlimited capacity. The Wall Street Journal, in a video report in the midst of the war, citing a U.S. official, explicitly stated that there is a growing concern about Israel running out of defensive weapons and that the aero system interceptors, which play a key role in countering Iranian ballistic missiles, have become extremely scarce. The report highlighted the depth of this crisis with a key sentence from Tom Caraco, director of the Missile Defense Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Capability is not the issue, it is capacity that matters. In other words, Israeli systems may have the technical ability to intercept Iranian missiles, but their number of interceptors is not sufficient for a long and attritional war. This war also imposed staggering costs on Israel's main ally, the United States. According to a credible report, the U.S. fired 60 to 80 THAAD interceptors over 11 days to defend Israel. This number is equivalent to 15 to 20 percent of the entire U.S. global stockpile of this missile and is valued at over $800 million. This is while the United States has only seven operational THAAD systems worldwide, and consuming such a volume of strategic reserves in a short period severely calls into question America's ability to respond to potential crises in other parts of the world, especially in the Pacific region against China. Furthermore, the crisis was exacerbated by a severe economic asymmetry. The cost of each aero system interceptor is over $2 million, and for THAAD interceptors, it is between $12 to $15 million. 
In contrast, the manufacturing cost of Iranian ballistic missiles is estimated to be between $100,000 to about $1 million, depending on the model. This equation allows Iran to impose an unbearable financial and logistical burden on the opposing side at a much lower cost. Meanwhile, Military Watch magazine, in an analytical article, points to another aspect of Israel's vulnerability. From the magazine's perspective, the over-reliance on indigenous defense systems like Arrow and David's Sling has been Israel's Achilles' heel against Iranian missiles. Although these systems are technologically advanced, they have a major weakness. Their production and supply chain is limited and exclusive to Israel. In wartime, if the warehouses are emptied, replacing them quickly is not possible. This is while countries that use American systems like Patriot, and especially Aegis, can count on America's vast global stockpiles and much larger production lines. Among these, the Aegis system stands out as a prominent example. While the U.S. military has only seven or eight operational THAAD systems, the Aegis system is deployed on more than 74 Arleigh Burke-class destroyers and nine Ticonderoga-class cruisers in the U.S. Navy, as well as on allied vessels from countries like Japan and South Korea. In addition to the naval version, a land-based version of this system, named Aegis Ashur, has also been developed and deployed in strategic locations like Romania and Japan. This system is an integrated combat system that combines the powerful AN-SPY-1 radar with Mark 41 vertical launchers and advanced interceptors like the SM-3 and SM-6. Numerous reports of heavy U.S. transport aircraft landing in Israel in the days following the ceasefire could be a sign of an effort to urgently repair this very vulnerability. What is your opinion on Iran's missiles with multiple warheads? And in the event of continued war or another attack, can Israel's defense systems resist them? Please write your opinions for us in the comments. If you liked this video, please like it and share it. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please subscribe to the Top Strategist channel and hit the bell icon to be notified of our future videos. Thank you for being with us until the end of this video.